there's been zero facial nerve injuries. Uh, hematomas happen with every technique. Um, no facial hematomas, so, and uh, infection. I mean, I think hematoma, someone has to take back to the operating room for that. So, uh, so basically with this technique, um, it's essentially a uh, modified deep link technique, but you want to isolate the platysma muscle in three different areas. You want to isolate it in the middle of the neck, along within the face, uh, now that we know that uh, it goes a strong uh, uh, component of the face aging process, and posteriorly along the neck. So isolating this muscle in three different parts of the neck will allow us to uh, manipulate that. And so, um, I find that almost every patient that comes in needs cervical regraping of some sort, even people who are really young. Um, and there's some people who come in at age 42 and 43 who want to face them. And, uh, and they may have just a little bit of jowling. These are actually deceptively hard cases because number one, the younger the patient, usually the more of a scar than they have. They're going to scar more poorly. It's kind of counterintuitive. Probably a little more swelling. And they want to see impact, but they don't want to look cold. So that's really a patient you have to, you have to strive for an after result if that's uh, someone who's uh, you're going to do a face lift up. Um, not everyone needs a platysmoplasty. Um, when you're looking at the midline of the neck, um, I think it's important to um, release it from in here. But if you're doing a platysmoplasty in everyone, some patients, especially uh, obese patients, when you put the platysma together, it actually may make this area more full. So if you just sort of release this area, release the mandibular, you release the skin in here, um, and address the submental fat, um, then uh, they can pull the platysma more laterally, and you're going to get more of an L. And those patients want as much of an L as they can get. Um, addressing subplatysmal fat. Uh, this is one of those areas you always have to be uh, cautious about. If you take too much fat, and especially subplatysmal fat, you can get over hollow. So you have to be very, very selective. Uh, in New York, it was uh, you know maybe 10% of the patients that would happen, maybe less. In Chicago, it's a different population. Uh, they like uh, sausage and pork and all that other stuff. So it's probably uh, you know 40% um, of patients who, who would uh, benefit from that. Um, addressing platysmal bands. Um, there's a patient, usually thinner patients, you'll see that, like an isolated band or another band. And uh, I think uh, there's both types of this role that you want to go on. Um, I think a platysmal path, you're putting it together up here and actually cutting the band is, is, is uh, beneficial, but you have to be uh, worried about being too aggressive cutting the muscle because you can get some weird facial expressions and weird movements. Um, and then we talked about the platysma and the dermal attachments. Um, and another common area is where do I make the incision? Um, you actually want to make it just above the submental crease. The reason is if you make it just in the crease, it tends to, to not look as good. It tends to pull down below the crease, and you'll see just a little bit less of a refined result. If you make it just above the crease, It'll actually, when it heals, kind of fall into that area. Uh, another common area I see is uh, not defatting the submentum, uh, the lower flat, the inferior flat enough. So you see like an old extra fullness there. And uh, sometimes people with too much submentum flat. So you see that, you see that extra fullness along the submentum. And again, I don't think it looks quite as, as defined as a result. Um, and then here's what we're talking about, the artistic component. Uh, you never want to be real dogmatic about how you do it. Just say, I'm just going to do this and do that with the patient. It's always a matter of adjusting your technique to every patient. So knowing as much as you can about all the different techniques, and depending on what the patient has and their concern is, uh, sort of working with that. So if you know you're taking a lot of fat, you know you're going to have to redrink the skin and adjust your incision so you can accommodate for that. If there's a lot of laxity to the skin, someone's older, uh, you know that they're going to have a little bit more descent in two or three months. You may actually, in that case, have to pull more skin. Um, your vector of pull, someone with deep wrinkles, if you pull that vertically, their lines are going to readjust, and they're going to have um, it's going to be an obvious look of the face So you have to sort of pull that um, accordingly with different patients. And the amount of cheekbone enhancement. Um, most men don't want to have real prominent cheekbones. And it uh, looks great in Natalie Portman, but for a guy to look like that, it can make the face look too uh, effeminate. Um, so this is just uh, working through a submental crease. Uh, we looked at this. Uh, I call that an anchoring point. And that's coming out, I think, in a couple months in, in uh, archives of facial plastic. Um, uh, it can matter, but some of these revision cases I've looked at, uh, and you see, uh, like, it feels like the suture is torn through something. And there's a lot of tension in place in the tissue, but it's also been torn through uh, uh, the anchoring point. So where you anchor it, you want a strong point, because not only do you have to deal with the force of putting this here, but patients are, are moving. The people are talking, they're chewing, uh, and half the patients are, you know, doing whatever they want, you know, three, four days later. So um, 
you have to be real conscientious that there's going to be a tremendous amount of force on this. So the stronger your anchoring point is, the stronger your point is on your, um, on your tismal, the, the stronger, uh, uh, the more likely you can have your flap uh, not tear and not have release. So we looked at various uh, anchoring points in the face. We sort of measured it with force of how much force it would take to tear it. And essentially what we found, uh, if you actually go into the periosteum of the zygoma, that was the strongest uh, by far. And that's, that's kind of the concept of the max lift, which is another variant of the lift that's out there. Um, uh, we looked at vertical and horizontal placement through the uh, temporal fascia. We found that horizontal placement is much stronger than vertical, and that's because the fibers are always going up and down, superior to inferior rather than the other way. Um, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the ligament by the earlobe versus just the SCM fashion in front, the ligament by the earlobe um, was actually much stronger, and you can actually see this fibrous attachment to the earlobe, and you can actually grab a, a decent bite. The facial nerve is quite deep. Uh, if you do product, you should realize that the facial nerve is, you're not going to hit the facial nerve in that. And then the other area we looked at, number six and seven is not on here, is the fascia over the SCM versus the fascia of the mastoid periosteum. And we found that the fascia of the mastoid periosteum was much stronger as well. So um, we found that that's, um, uh, at least for, for me, it ends up being uh, stronger points to fix that you're, you're faced to. And again, we can see the fascia of the earlobe uh, repositioning that position there. And then repositioning that position posteriorly to the mastoid periosteum. And, uh, you know, now I think uh, I'm even more aggressive and I put it one here, one here, and one here, just to really make sure that neck is the patisma is undermined and that that uh, is really fixated well. Um, we talked about skin redraping, don't put tension on the skin. Um, a lot of people talk about vertical placement and vertical aging, um, you know, um, and uh, if that works great, but I found that when, when you lift it up, it changes it to normal ways and look to change the natural versus relaxed skin tension lines. So that if you place it long, you angle the mandible. Uh, you get a thing that we sort of talked about. And if you look at this face over here, she looks like she's on the body of a, you know, a 200 pound, you know, 220 pound uh, person. And over here, it's more of establishing that, that higher cheekbone. 